I'm Yuri Tuulos. I'm a co-founder in a company called Bitdeli. And uh, Bitdeli is a platform for web analytics. Um, and um, I'm, it seems that I'm here to talk about from, uh, like, from the point of view of uh, like a, somebody who's using D3 in, in production. Um, and actually, our story is more like we started with Backbone. Uh, we started using that to build our application um, and then um, just incorporated D3 when we started to have some charts, when we needed some visualizations. And at first we used NVD3, uh, which Miles uh, mentioned earlier, but then we needed more control over what we, uh, uh, what we showed to our users, and that's why we wanted to use plain D3. And from there, it was just a struggle of, of how to combine Backbone and D3 together. And um, so let's see. There's uh, some points that were touched on earlier. But um, from our point of view, why use reusable charts? Well, of course, there's the modularity. Um, just having a piece of code that's separate from others, it's just good programming logic. Uh, just to have the uh, the functionality in, uh, in a different set, like a different file or a different, it just makes everything easier. Um, one other interesting thing is abstraction. Um, some may see this as a good thing, some may see uh, like a bad thing. Um, but for a backbone developer, abstracting away the D3 code is actually a good thing. Uh, we're all D3 developers here. But some, some people see D3 as a really hard piece of, uh, uh, like, a, is a visualization kernel. It's some, something that's really hard to get a grasp on. So it, for some people, it may, might, might be good to have D3 as something they can use, but they might not have to understand it. Um, of course, there's maintenance. Uh, Chris talked about testing. Um, that's always better with reusable charts. And collaboration. Um, and this is interesting because a lot of companies are nowadays uh, open sourcing parts of their application. Uh, there's uh, Bootstrap from Twitter. Um, there's a lot of code that is inspired by something that's running on production and gets open sourced and gets a life of its own. So, and that's something that's really interesting. And with reusable charts, it's, uh, it's actually possible to share the benefits with other people too. So, um, so let's see, like, uh, like Miles talked about earlier, um, it's a different kind of thing to use a D3 with uh, server-side frameworks or client-side frameworks. Uh, with server-side, you have kind of, uh, you have this huge chunk of HTML that comes from the server. And, um, and you have like placeholder elements uh, that you have for the charts. And then you get the data, um, and then you render the charts there. And it's just, uh, this is a really high view, high level overview, but um, it gives a sense of what we're doing here. And um, with client-side frameworks, you have a really, really thin piece of, uh, of HTML first. And the job of the JavaScript, or everything that happens is about getting the data, and based on that, rendering the whole markup, rendering all the charts and everything. So the SVG elements, the, the stuff that needs to be for D3, doesn't even exist first. So stuff has to happen in the right order. And that's why D3 has to be, play well with the framework that's underlying the application. So uh, there might be a list view that's, that the, gets rendered first. Then there might be some items. And inside those items, are the actual charts. So stuff ha has to happen in the right order. Um, so a few words about Backbone. So there's a lot of confusion about what Backbone is, mainly because uh, people usually clump together Backbone, Ember, Angular, and for good reason. There's, of course, they achieve a lot of the same goals. But Backbone actually is a really, really lightweight piece of code. And um, it's mainly used to manipulate and query data. Uh, it's not about UI widgets. It's not about um, 
It's not about like HTML markup. You can decide those on your own. Uh, but it does help you with Ajax. It does help you with uh, the application structure. And um, for that reason, because it is missing those pieces, um, the creator of Backbone actually says that it's, it's a library, not a framework. Well, you can go into semantics here, but either way, it's, it's a, I, I, I'd say it's a good way to create your own framework. And that's what I like about it. Because um, it plays well with others. You can combine different pieces of code. You can combine a templating engine. You can get a visualization engine like D3. And you can combine them together to get an application um, like you want. Um, and yeah, I, I have all the slides uh, later as, as like HTML. So uh, all the links and everything is there. Um, so let's see what we want to build here. Basically, what we want to build is kind of uh, like spreadsheet charts. This is what everybody knows about. Like even non-developers know how to use Excel charts in Excel. And the basic thing you do is is that you just select some data, um, like a, basically a subset of data, and then say, okay, I, I want to build a chart out of this. And when you're building the chart, uh, you may have some options like which attributes get uh, which uh, axes and everything. But like basically you have some defaults and then you can configure something. And after you uh, click OK, you have the chart. So that's basically the workflow you want to have. Um, and with Backbone and D3, it might look something like this. Um, you have the data, maybe in JSON. It might come from Ajax. It might come from uh, users. Um, and then you have like a, this is really object oriented here. So this is really non D3 code. Uh, but it's, it's a nice contrast to what we had earlier. So uh, we're creating a new object here. Um, it's, it's a object that inherits the backbone view. So it has a lot of functionality built in that makes it really good at handling uh, something that lives in the DOM. And then we just give it an element. This is a selector. OK, let's put it in this element. This collection here is just the data to use. Uh, and we just wrap it in a backbone collection because it has some nice functionality. But you don't have to care about it now. Uh, it basically looks like this JSON here. And then we define just this is the minimal amount of uh, configuration we have to do for a bar chart. Just say which properties get mapped to which axis. So we'll, have to want, we'll want to have the uh, letters on the x-axis and the frequency on the y-axis. And then we just render it. And this line here runs all the D3 code. So it's all hidden away. And uh, well, if, if you don't know D3, it doesn't matter. But of course, the developer who has made this framework knows a lot of D, about D3. So um, as it happens, I'm using the same example. Uh, good for you, because uh, we already went to a part of this. So, uh, so this is the simple, simple bar chart example that's on the uh, D3 gallery. It's one of the basic examples that Mike Bostak has provide, provided for D3. And um, if we look at the code, it's, it's like really, really simple D3 code. This is something that, that's like, uh, people are used to when uh, doing something with D3. Um, and by itself, it might be readable. It's, it's, it's pretty good. It's great as an example. But as a piece of a larger application, <coughs> it's, uh, it's not optimal. There's a lot of, lot of global variables. There, there's a lot of stuff that, that uh, could be uh, hidden inside. So, and the reusable chart API is one way of doing that. But I'll uh, handle another way. So um, if we look at an overview of the code, it's kind of split into these sections. And um, like there's same kind of stuff happening in different parts of the code. So there's definitely something that could be unified here. There's definitely something that could be reused in other types of charts. For example, uh, like a bar chart could have the same margins as a line chart. Makes sense. So 
the biggest problem here is that D3 is declarative and all these MV whatever frameworks are object oriented. So there's a different kind of paradigm going on here and what matters in the end is that what the end user sees. And with the, um, with the reusable chart API that Chris and Miles talked about, uh, it um, like exposes a declarative API. And that's fine, that's fine for some, but like that's the fun part of open source that we can have all these different approaches and everybody can choose their own. So what I'm proposing here, this is just a simple example, is like an object-oriented way of building D3 charts. And um, so we'll just encapsulate the D3 into Backbone. And uh, yeah, it kind of looks like this. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, some, 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 some might say, okay, you're just ruining perfectly good veggies. And yeah, well, yeah, that's right. Uh, but some people think that like bacon goes with everything. Everything's better with bacon. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that works for somebody. So, so here's a piece of D3 code. Here's a really simple, like this is the margin convention. We have a, can you see it back there? Somewhat, okay, you can check out the details later. Um, so it's defining the margins and the dimensions on the chart. And what it looks like in Backbone could be something like this. We have a uh, view that's, uh, so we're extending a Backbone view. So this is the base view that's handling a DOM element. And we're building a base chart class. So it's handling all kinds of charts. And uh, this is all the functionality that can be shared between different types of charts. So we have the uh, margin as a default option. Uh, so we don't have to define it every time uh, if we don't want to. Um, and then the code is pretty similar. If you compare these, there's a similar kind of structure uh, only we don't use global uh, variables or closures. We just define the important parts as uh, properties on the uh, object itself. So we're uh, building like an inner state of the chart. So, uh, and there's uh, some stuff that's happening uh, like in Backbone, but this should be the basic stuff that uh, gets you started. Um, then, uh, what we want to see in uh, any kind of a base chart is we want to have scales, we want to have axes, uh, we want to have some kind of representation of the data. It might be bars, it might be lines, but there's a lot of like similarity that can be bundled into the base. And, um, and this is what's happening here. We just have a, like this is an interface that uh, the, other ex uh, the, the other types of charts can implement. And again, how it looks like when implemented is that there's a bar chart and we pass the attributes. Uh, so, so the defaults might be X and Y, but when we pass letter and frequency, they just get overridden. So this is the kind of interface we want to see in object-oriented stuff. And one thing to note here is that we're passing these options like Initially, we're just passing it one time and after that everything is written in stone. So um, it's kind of a different uh, way of thinking from uh, D3 where you can just first make the chart and then afterwards uh, define the options. So, but the different uh, approaches here. So um, then going along, we want to see, okay, now we have the, uh, so yeah, sorry. So this is the base that we want to have for all the charts. Then when we want to make a bar chart, we have to define a, a specific set of scales. So for the X axis, we have a ordinal scale, so specific bars. And for the Y axis, we have a linear, uh, linear scale. And in the original D3 code, uh, we're defining the domains after we have got the data from the server. But as it happens in the uh, backbone case, we're thinking more like we have the data and now we're creating the chart. So that's why we can just use the data right away and have these two kind of getters 
So we have getters for both the scales. And so we're just uh, like separating this functionality into these nice functions or methods for the class. And uh, that's, that's just the one way to uh, some, uh, of course, some D3 developers might think that, okay, this is just ruining everything. But uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's a backbone way of thinking. And it might, uh, uh, and it happens to work pretty well with D3 too. And, um, and as you can see here, we're defining an additional option uh, for the bar padding. So uh, in addition to all the defaults we had in the base class, we can define more uh, default options. So next we want to have axes. And well, we have the axes here. First we define them uh, and then we render them. And in backbone, it looks kind of like this. It's one method that renders the axis. It could be two methods, but I didn't see the sense of, of changing it here. So, uh, so this is almost the same code. There's some li little differences. We don't have the scales uh, in this scope, so we're just grabbing them from the object itself. So we're accessing this dot scales dot x, and that gives us the scale that was uh, initialized earlier. And um, next, or uh, last, in the bar chart example is uh, rendering the data. And these uh, lines of code render are the D3 code that render the, uh, the bars. And uh, how it could look in uh, Backbone would be something like this. Uh, we get the scales as uh, x and y. These are now lo local variables. And after <laughs> this, it kind of looks uh, like the same code. Um, the only weird thing that's happening here is that we have a uh, method for getting the data. And I don't have it uh, written out here, but it's just a simple method of uh, like getting the original data, mapping out, getting the properties that were defined in the options, uh, and mapping them as x and y. So in the function below, we can use it uh, like in a generic way. We don't have to care about which uh, properties the user wants to see or what the data looks like. So it's all about uh, like abstracting away uh, the schema of the data and like even the context that the, that the chart is used in. So this is pretty much as basic as it gets. Uh, it's, there's a lot of uh, stuff that was, wasn't shown, but these are the basic step, steps that could be taken to uh, wrap D3 in backbone. And what we see here is, that, uh, is the end result. So we'll just, uh, we'll just create the bar chart object, and then we render it. And it runs all the axes, it runs all the scales, it runs all the bar uh, rendering. And the end result should look same. And of course, there's more. We could do uh, rendering, uh, render again based on changing data, as Miles' example had. Um, we could uh, get the data from a remote place. Uh, we could have interactivity. Um, and we could handle like DOM events inside the SVG. Um, and that's all that uh, can be bound with the Backbone API. So. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff that could be done. And of course, more chart types. Everybody loves more chart types. Uh, actually, uh, about the DOM events, uh, there was uh, just uh, yesterday or something, uh, Shirley Wu, uh, who is here, oh, hi, uh, wrote a blog post about uh, handling uh, DOM events in Backbone and D3. And there's some interesting stuff uh, because jQuery doesn't handle the SVG namespace as well as it uh, should. So uh, there's some hacks that have to be done, but um, there's, uh, yeah. Actually, like uh, these examples I showed is a part of uh, the code we're using an, in production right now, and we're working on open sourcing uh, it as a library. But as you all know, uh, getting code publicized is uh, a, like a little different thing than using it yourself. So we're working on it.
And um, so, yeah, to get started, you can just uh, see the D3 documentation. You can see the Backbone documentation. If you want to try out Backbone, if you haven't tried before, I really recommend the Backbone boilerplate that's on GitHub. Um, it's a good way to get a sense of what, what pieces of code you need, uh, which uh, files should go where, uh, just a basic project structure for Backbone. And uh, yeah, uh, Miles uh, posted a uh, blog about uh, like a Backbone D3 integration. It's a different approach than mine, but uh, you should uh, really research all these different approaches and see what works for you and especially what works for the context you're working in. Thanks. Um, I, uh, yeah, I already mentioned we, uh, we are open sourcing this at some point, uh, hopefully soon. And uh, check out uh, Bitdeli. We have a nice offer for developers. If you have GitHub accounts uh, or GitHub repos and you want to see who is visiting <laughs> them, so you can get free analytics for your GitHub repos. That's the URL. And um, I'll have the slides posted in the Meetup group later. Thanks.